Okay, so for those of you who stayed and wanted to hear this again, uh, I admire your courage. Uh, for those of you who are new to the room, um, I am Dr. Raggio, as, as I just was introduced. I practice at Hospital for Special Surgery. Uh, I've been in practice for about 33 years. And the goal here is to try to lead you through just wh what we know about orthopedics in types of EDS as well as at the end to really do some exercise. And from the response I got from the first group that I did, I think definitely doing the, uh, spending a little bit more time on the exercise and maybe a little less time on the background might be helpful for everybody. Um, I also ask that you don't take pictures because these are proprietary, these are my slides. And also some of this is not even, it's not published and it's just in the works right now. So I ask that you do not take pictures of this. I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards about anything that I have on the slides though. So um, I forgot to say in the last time I have no disclosures that are relevant to this presentation, though it's on here. So we're gonna go through, and I'm gonna go through quicker because I think you have more questions at the end. What type of EDS has orthopedic involvement? What do we know about surgery in the EDS population? And what are some basic principles of care and trying to prevent you from getting to the orthopedic surgeon? So we know that there are many types of EDS and about nine of them have major orthopedic components to them. We define them again, as you all know, what the Biton score is, and so we want to make sure that we, we examine the patient and make sure that they um, have been examined for the Biton score. The importance here, and I made this point before, is this is the biggest problem that I see in people. This is the hyperextension of the knee. This hyperextension of the knee leads you to put your pelvis out of balance, your hips out of balance, and your foot out of balance. So we're gonna work very hard in PT in getting rid of this. And for people who have children, you wanna work very hard on it. And for people who are adults, uh, you're gonna to have to work super hard because this is a real problem. In children, if you allow them to go into this position all the time, they will actually grow their bone so that it's growing in that position. And so then as an adolescent and an adult, it becomes much harder to correct with just physical therapy because you have overstretched the ligaments. And as you know, ligaments are what hold bone to bone. And you've overstretched the joint capsule. That's what's around the, the joint itself. It's kind of a balloon. You've misshapen the ends of the bone through cartilage. That's the soft stuff that's at the end of our, our joints. And, and that's not good. And so you definitely, definitely, definitely want to be very aggressive at preventing this. And, what, and you want to have what we call a soft knee. And I'll show you what that is later and we'll talk about that. So to me, that is a major problem when I see that. I'm less worried about some of the other things. Now, the orthopedic involvement we see in all these types of EDS, and the numbers next to it are the numbers that have been reported in the literature of known genetically tested patients. And clearly, as you see, the most common is the hypermobile form of EDS. 90% of all patients with EDS have this form, and we'll talk about that. Classic is about one out of 20,000 uh, people, so it depends on your population. Whoa. Gosh, you really wanted me to move fast there. Okay, so if we look at classic EDS, classical EDS, this is, these are uh, people who have an autosomal dominant condition, generally in COL-5, uh, one out of 20,000, as I said, and subluxations, dislocations. Now, what's the difference between a subluxation and a dislocation? A subluxation is when the joint that we're talking about is still has contact with both sides of it. A dislocation is when they have no contact anymore. They're totally out of contact. So that's the difference. Um, we're talking about foot deformities. Most common, as you know, is probably a flat foot or a pest planus. Um, again, because ligaments get stretched over time, ligaments, again, whole bone to bone. 
tendons or what whole muscle, the bone, just so we're sure, clear on what we're talking about. And of course, scoliosis, which is a curve of the spine that brings you sideways. Um, so that's, those are some of the common features. And, you know, again, these are not, you don't have to have everything, but you have to have many of this. Uh, and clearly you have to have the mutation. So here are, oh Lord, here are the features that were reported in 2013 with patients with classical EDS. And again, looking at this, you can see everybody has joint hypermobility or they wouldn't be in this category. You can see the flat feet at down at 62.5%, spine involvement. Okay, a little bit of osteopenia and osteoporosis. And I, I touched on this in the last talk, and I think it's important that everybody knows is some, some basic principles. Your bones respond to your muscles. So if I were to send you to space and you would be in zero gravity, you would get no stress on your bones and you would get no stress really on your muscles and so you would come back osteoporotic from space. The same thing if you're at bed rest. Same thing if you sit a lot. Same thing if you're not doing weight-bearing activities, you're not stressing the bone, but you're also not stressing the muscle. And muscles pull on bone, and bones talk to muscle. So it's a two-way street. So strong muscles are important for strong bones, and strong bones are important for strong muscles. So it, it works together. And that will come up when we talk about the importance of doing exercise. So classical like EDS uh, is autosomal recessive, tends to be, as you see, the mutation in the uh, tenacin. And in this case, wound healing is normal. So orthopedic surgeons seem to be less worried about that. Um, the, or, the features that, again, you see is the joint hypermobility. And again, muscle. So we're hearing the same things over and over, very commonly. If we now go quickly through the rarer forms of EDS, it's not rare if you have it, but rarer in the literature, um, the Cowan A2, autosomal recessive that causes cardiovalvular, again, we're looking here at generalized hypermobility, more of the distal joints. Distal means, you probably already know, things that are farther away from the center of your body. So distal are the little, the, where your nails attach, so those are distal, your toes are distal. Central or proximal are our bigger joints, are our shoulders, our hips, and our knees. Um, so that just for terminology. The other form, rarer form of EDS, we look at again, which is a, col a collagen one abnormality, is the uh, arthrochalasic form. And here, we're looking at people who have congenital hip dislocation, meaning they're born with their hips uh, out of socket uh, and they are dislocated. These need to be addressed early. And the key for the orthopedic surgeons, if there's any in the group here or the pediatricians and parents, is that it's recognized as part of a larger picture. Because what will happen with these children is their hips will be difficult to maintain reduced and they'll go through a lot of treatment. If you know from the beginning that you're dealing with more of a syndromic form of a dislocated hip, you're gonna be quicker to do more surgery earlier, which in the long run is gonna be more helpful probably to the child. This is also the type of EDS that can also look like osteogenesis imperfecta, because you can see it's associated with about 22% of fractures. Wormian bones, which is just a specific way of looking at uh, the, the bones of the skull look, uh, as well as dislocation. So again, the, this differential, and as you know, osteogenesis imperfecta also is a collagen one abnormality. So it's a spectrum, and this is really important to make sure that we um, uh, figure out where this patient falls and examine the whole patient as again, you'll see me mention later, but important when your child is first diagnosed. Next, we come to another form of EDS that has the orthopedic involvement. You can see the list is getting longer and longer, the blue side. 
on this is kyphoscoliotic. Well, it's a no-brainer because kyphosis is round backness, scoliosis is a curvature. So clearly this one was named almost for orthopedics. And these are two genes that are affected with it, the PLOD1 and the FKB14. Uh, so again, you can see hip dislocations. It's a very recurrent theme here, contractures. The importance of these are that for the orthopedic surgeon or the, the young family or the pediatrician is that when you see any of these signs that appear in blue and you say, hmm, I have three or four things, you then have to say, I need to get genetic testing on this family. You don't want to treat as an orthopedic surgeon and you don't want to be treated as a patient with blinders on because then all you're doing is treating 13 or 14 different signs and symptoms and never realizing it's all part of a big picture, which means you could have A, predicted some of this, B, if you knew this, hopefully you could have done more preventative things like the correct physical therapy, correct bracing, and not just follow your tail around, and that's really important. So that's why the lists are important just to see, hmm, does my patient or do I fit in any of these? Next, we come to another rare form of EDS called the spondylodysplastic form. And again, you can see all the things. Again, we've got osteoporosis in 30% of the, of the patients reported. Again, fractures. So I know years ago people said to me, nobody with fractures could have EDS. People with EDS just don't fracture. And, and I was like, that's just not right. That's, that's not right. Uh, it doesn't make sense, and it's not right. And fortunately now, these articles that have come out in 2017 have some solid numbers that we can actually use. I know Dr. Graham years ago said they could fracture. I took him at his word, and I believed him, and he was right. Um, and I think that that's really important. But for us, especially in the United States, we're often um, confronted with children who are born, babies that are born that have fractures. And the question is, is this abuse or not? And when you're trying to figure it out, it's very important that we're just not thinking of the obvious osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a brittle bone disease, that we are thinking of all these other genes and looking at the EDS panel, because I think we do miss some of these children, uh, and it's very important. Next, we get to another rare form, musculocontractual, and again, now you're seeing what, at least for us in the orthopedic realm, is kind of counterintuitive. We were always, everybody was always taught, oh no, you have EDS, you're loose as a goose. But no, you can be born with a club foot. That's what Tilipis equinovaris, TEV, stands for, which is not just that your foot was positioned incorrectly in utero, but that there was a real developmental stop point in the development of your foot, such that the foot is in a, a severe position and needs to be corrected most commonly with casting, but in syndromes, often with surgery. So again, the importance of figuring out, is there anything else going on with my child uh, is important to, to know. So I'm a real proponent of um, genetic testing. Okay. Next we get to the myopathic. Myopathic means muscle, you know that already, EDS. And it, these are people who have delayed motor development. So some of these children might be children that end up in neurology because they haven't walked by the age of 15 months, they don't sit up by the age of eight months, they're very low toned, so they're just kind of sitting like kind of a rag doll, and they are very loose in their joints. And you say, oh, they're just an unknown myopathy, they're just an unknown hypotonia. Again, I think if we start looking at these children more carefully, we're going to pick up forms of myopathic EDS. And so, again, this is an awareness for all of us who are in practice to think about this. Then we get to the 90% of everybody, the hypermobile EDS. We don't know the genetic etiology. I doubt it's going to be one thing. 
I think that there will be many genes that probably will be found. There will be modifier genes. And I think in a couple of years, God willing, instead of having a category hypermobile EDS, we will have five more categories, which we'll be able to put up and help people. Uh, because the more we know, uh, the, the easier it is to help. And, and what I mean by that is then we're able to say this surgery works well in this situation, but doesn't work well in this situation. The people that have this mutation don't do well with this, but do very well with that. I think that's really the key. I, I, it always reminds me of, you know, I tell people is, you know, if all of a sudden I said to you, okay, you're going on a trip and you think you're heading to Michigan, you know, in December, and so you've packed your parker, and the next thing you know, you get off the plane and you're in San Diego, and it's, you know, 80 degrees, and your parker is of no use. It's the same thing in medicine. We really want to have the right stuff in our suitcase so that we can be helpful and have things that we can pull out in the right conditions. So I, I think that's going to be important. So moving on, so as you know, hypermobile EDS, recurrent joint pain, joint dislocations, scoliosis, lordosis. What is lordosis? Lordosis is when you stand, your hiney sticks out a little bit more. That is really common in people that have loose ligaments. Because what happens is you tend to stand on your hips. So what you do is you stand so that your knees are back, but you stand forward like this on your hips so that you really don't have to use, do your, use your muscles at all. You're standing forward. That forces you to stick your back out like this, and that increases the lordosis. That increases your back pain. That weakens the abs. That makes you roll in. That makes your rhomboids weak. So now you're like this. I'm exaggerating. But that's what happens. And then you complain of pain. And someone says, oh, I can give you a shot here. Or, gee, let me fix the knee. And then you like are fixed, but you still have pain. You're not going to get out of pain until you get into balance. Until your body is balanced, you are going to be in pain. And we're going to talk about the principles of balancing your body in the last few slides that we will have. And we spend a lot of time with that. The other thing is proprioception. And proprioception is where you feel yourself in space and time. So if I were to close my eyes and put my arm out, I know that my arm, my elbow is slightly bent. People that have EDS seem to not have as good proprioception. And they can hyperextend their elbow, and I'll go, are you hyperextended? And uh, I'm not quite sure. I might be. You don't have that sense of stop. I shouldn't go that far. Whether that's something that happens because as a kid, you always went that far, and that's your normal, quote unquote, whether there's something innately different in the nociceptors, the things that are in the joint, I'm not sure. But it definitely is a reality, and definitely sometimes by putting orthotics in your shoes, you get better feedback, and so you walk better, so it all fits together. So you need to be aware of that, because what that means is you need to use your eyes to balance your body, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, you already know, I'm sure, EDS more common in females than males, at least reported EDS. So, those are the major types of EDS that have orthopedic involvement. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you don't have that type, you never have to see an orthopedist, but those are the major types in looking at the literature that just came out. And this data is from 2017 and 2013. So now let's look at the surgical outcomes. Because people say, well, OK, Doc, if I have surgery, am I going to get any better? I mean, that's the goal. You want the patient to feel better and to have a positive outcome about the surgery. So to do this, I looked back and I had a good student over the summer and we're still in the midst of this. So this is really not even hot off the press. This is kind of like in evolution. Uh, and we're looking at what do we need to collect? What data do we need? Because all of us in the room have to realize that we all have to follow certain forms. It is important that the patient have a full physical examination. 
There is nothing worse than looking and finding out someone had shoulder surgery and didn't real, the doctor didn't realize that they're walking really crooked because of their knee and not putting everything together because you're not going to do well. You know, if you're walking around with a large ligament discrepancy, someone's fixed your shoulder and you're trying to walk around in a sling like this. You're going to put forces on your body that you shouldn't do and need to be addressed preoperatively. Okay? So if, you're, if someone has told you you need surgery, what we normally tell the surgeons, if you should think someone with EDS or hypermobility needs surgery, you need to go home, lay down, and think about it. Okay? After you've thought about it, figure out do they need surgery right now and what's the outcome going to be, or more than not, what they need is a good physical therapy program, really get them strong as can be, then you might need surgery. Okay? Then you're going to be in better shape. Most likely, the first line of defense should not be surgery. And that's how I was taught. And that's what we try to, to impart on to others. Clearly, there are exceptions, uh, but that's a general principle. So when you go to a doctor, you want to have a full physical exam. You obviously want to have the bite and score. You want to know. The doctor needs to know this. And they need to test you for your strength, for your sensation, for your tone. Um, we clearly go through a full history, looking at dislocations, soft tissue injuries, bracing that's been done in the past. And bracing people look at as like a bad thing. Uh, you know, bracing, I had a brace. I mean, people even say it like meanly. I had a brace, did you have a brace? And it's like, no, bracing, I call them assistive devices. It's allowing you to function better. And that's what a brace should be. It should allow you to put less stress on a joint, have less instability of a joint, so that you can do more walking, have less pain, or whatever that functional thing you want to do is. And especially in children, I deal with children a lot, and the kids will be like, oh, I don't want to wear it. And I'm like, you're growing your foot. You're growing your shoulder. We need to protect it so that as it grows, it's going to grow correctly. If I were to take out, and the experiments have been done like this, if I were to take a joint and let it go in and out, in and out, in and out, you misshape that joint. That joint is going to be misshapen forever. You can't get that back. So in children, it's really important to be very strict in trying to control their joint. And bracing is the best way, but correct bracing that actually will work. Um, clearly, we go through medical history, moving on here, and then operations. So let's see. So we looked at, uh, we have a few patients, we have more than this, but this is the information I could get together to get here. And we had 21 females and three males that we had information on. Of that, 12 females had surgery and one male had surgery. And the average age of surgery was about 40 years of age, though we had a range, as you can see, from 13 to 75. They had 25 surgeries in these 13 people. Nine patients had one surgery, one patient had two, two had three surgeries, and one had eight surgeries. So that was our frequent flyer patient. Uh, it wasn't the same joint over and over. They just liked us, so they had things done. So that was a good thing, um, so not to worry. Um, looking at the surgery that was done, and I mentioned this to the group before, for those of you who don't know, Hospital for Special Surgery is only an orthopedic and rheumatology hospital. Uh, it's, one of, it's the oldest in the country. And um, we do, we're known for our total joint replacements. It's where some of total, besides Dr. Charnley, not besides, with Dr. Charnley in England who developed the total hip, uh, people at our institution developed hips and developed knees called the insole bursting and the Ranawat knee. And so we've been doing joints for a long, long time uh, and are very comfortable. So it's why you see we're going to have some total joint replacements uh, uh, skew. The other group that has a lot of surgery, we have a very, very large sports medicine group at our institution. And they have been interested in soft tissue uh, disorders for a long time. So those surgeons do a lot. 
uh, and then we have our pediatric group and we operate as needed. Uh, we try to keep the kids out of the OR and in the physical therapist's office if we can do that. So you can see again the mix. We had some hips, shoulders, knees. Again, these are the types. So you can see the, the preponderance here in the green of the total joint replacements that were done. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you can see the soft tissue and soft tissue and bone. Now, as all of you know, with EDS, depending on the type of EDS, depending, I mean, there is a spectrum. Not every person with EDS has the same amount of flexibility or the same amount of subluxation dislocations. So the decision to do a soft tissue repair versus a bony repair is very individual. And I said this before in the last lecture and I'll say it again, there is no one surgery for everybody with EDS. That is a total mistake. You have to individualize it. You have to look at what's the issue in the joint itself, what is the quality of the tissue in this person, meaning are they super lax, have they had other dislocations, what's the whole gestalt? Then you have to look at what's the age of the person, because that's going to impact, do I have arthritis in this joint, don't I have arthritis in the joint? And then you have to look at what does the person want from this surgery, okay? I tell patients all the time, I could operate on your x-rays and I'd be done in 10 minutes. That would be really easy. But operating on people, you have to say what is the goal of this surgery? Is it to make the shoulder more stable so they can go on and play tennis? Is it to make the wrist more stable so they can type and continue to work? What is the goal of your surgery? And I think when you look at it that way, and that's a shared decision, you say, okay, we might give up a little cosmesis, or I'm, that means how you look, or I might make you a little tighter than normal because you need this or that, or you know what? I don't think my surgery is gonna help. I think you need to use a brace for what you're doing and then do these exercises. And because if I operate on you, I'm gonna take away function. That's such an important thing. So again, our surgeries are not easily classified. I mean, we've done it this way, but the reason why, as we're trying to mine down on this, is what we really have to work with the patient on. We wanted to say, too, patients always say, and I always tell patients when they come to surgery, you have two, two people in the room. You have me, who's doing the surgery, and then you have the anesthesiologist who's actually keeping you alive. Uh, so, you know, make sure you get a good one. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, we looked at anesthesia, and again, only about 35% of our patients had general anesthesia. That means the tube down the throat. We had a combination of general and some peripheral blocks. Our institution is known for the use of uh, non-general anesthetics in orthopedics. So again, it, it does not surprising to me that 65% of our patients did not have general anesthesia. Uh, and again, we had no complications from anesthesia, which is terrific. Uh, we had no intraoperative complications. That means the patients made it in and off the table in good condition. Postoperatively, out of 22 surgeries that we had, we had eight complications. Um, the, of the ones that I think are probably more related to EDS or the infected wound at an IV site, because that has more of the skin issue, which is right here, and a sacral ulcer, which we really rarely ever see in anyone in orthopedics. Our complication rate for surgeries is somewhere less than one to 2% at our institution. So this is different. The others, I would not say so much are, um, are complications as much as things that we know can happen. So a blood clot after a total uh, hip is not a surprise. We see that in the population of people who have uh, total hips done. So I think what we, we need more numbers. We actually need more numbers to say what's going to be significant. However, what we can say is that we had no scar healing issues whatsoever. So uh, whether it's a testament to the surgeons who realized they had to be gentle, or whether it's a testament to the patient that we were operating on, I don't know. 
but we did not have any healing issues. Okay, so now we get to the fun part of the talk. That's kind of the background and the science and what we need to know and everybody can now wake up. Um, because now we're going to do some orthopedic considerations. So this is the take home message for those of you who are um, patients uh, or advocates of patients or you are doctors because we're all advocates. So orthopedic considerations. Number one, everybody has to have a genetic evaluation, period. You do not go to surgery unless you know what's going on. I just foolhardy. You need to know what is going on. It helps to know your mutation as far as I'm concerned because if we're smart enough and we look at what does that mutation do, we might think what other parts can it affect. So you have to do that. You just don't want to go in willy-nilly. The other thing is right now if you're 65 years old, what they told your parents when you were two is totally ridiculous because in 1952, we had no idea about any of this genetics. If, if you're 45, we didn't have any idea about this. If you're 20, we probably didn't have any idea about the extent to this. So it's really important because that's the most common thing. I see patients come in and they say to me, I have X, Y, and Z. Um, I, I run a skeletal dysplasia uh, center. I'm the orthopedic director of it at special surgery. And I am shocked. I'm not shocked. I'm actually just taken aback sometimes, and I'll say, no, you don't have that. Uh, we know in 2017 you have B, C, and D. And so it's important. And genetics is not just about having children. Genetics is about knowing how your body has, is different or how it's affected. So I think that's really important. Um, so once you know and you've you're figured out you fall in what category, then whatever doctor you see should really do a full evaluation. The entire body should be examined and the balance of your body. Many people are in great shape, but they're out of balance. And therefore, they pull a hamstring. They get a stress fracture in their low back. I see it all the time in young athletes. They're like, oh, no, I'm in great shape. I'm like, you might be in great shape, but you are out of balance. And what does that mean? It means our head has to sit over our high knee. It means our knees have to, if we drew a line down from them, have to go through our second toe. And it means we have to stand, which everybody forgets, in the sagittal plane, which nobody knows what that is, but the sagittal plane is what I look like from the side, not like this. This is wrong. Roll shoulders, high knees sticking out, wrong. So you don't want to be anterior tilt, you don't want to be like this, because then you're going to be like this. So most people uh, are out of balance, and that's what we have to work on. And as I was sitting in the back earlier this morning, I could see that most people in this room were sitting terribly. Nobody was firing their rhomboids. Now, most people say to me, where the heck are my rhomboids? I mean, where, let's, your rhomboids are the muscles between your shoulder blades. When, so if you squeeze your shoulder blades together, okay, when you're sitting, squeeze them, squeeze them. This is the, act, this is the audience participation, okay? Because it doesn't help if I talk at you. We have to talk to each other and with each other. And so if you squeeze your shoulder blades together, you feel that? The first thing you should feel is you're no longer so tight in your traps. The traps are these muscles. So when the rhomboids are working, the traps say thank you they relax. When they relax, you get rid of your headache. Okay? Traps, tight traps, very bad on, on, on posture. So you need to work on rhomboids. You need to work on your core. You need to go to physical therapy um, and learn what to do. Now, when you go to physical therapy, you go, you should have a specific targeted program but then, unless you really like the physical therapist, you shouldn't be married to the physical therapist, okay? The physical therapist should be your guide to help you prepare for surgeries, get better from surgeries, and tune you up, okay? I mean, I like my car mechanic. Well, thank you for making that bigger. I like my car mechanic, but I don't want to see them all the time, okay? It's the same thing. 
we tune up our cars. Sometimes you have to go back in for a little tune up. But you don't want to go to the mechanic every day and go, now I think it's doing this. Does my, do I need air in my tire? What do I need? Blah, blah, blah. So you need a home program. You want to have realistic outcomes. And I say this, what do I mean by that? Surgery is not going to make you better. Surgery is one of the things in the whole continuum to get better. So you do PT beforehand. You might do nutritional things, whatever you're going to do. Then you do the surgery, and then you work hard after the surgery in getting yourself better and taking advantage of what the surgery is giving you. But surgery is not the end. And I think that's where surgeons don't tell that to patients at all. I can tell you, surgeons say, oh, you'll be fine in six weeks. Don't worry, you'll be back to work. And it's like, what? I can't even get out of bed after six weeks. This isn't, I don't feel better. Because surgery is one piece of the picture. You have to do lifetime exercise. Just like brushing your teeth every day, if you have EDS, you must exercise correctly daily. Everyone should have a home program. If you're someone in this room who's over 50, you better start exercising too because you have to do exercises. It's not just unique to EDS. It's any chronic condition, aging, anything, we need to keep our body in the best shape it can be. Most of us get away with using only 50% of our muscle mass every day if we have nothing else wrong with us. Once you get a hit of anything, an injury, aging, EDS, osteogenesis imperfecta, that lowers, and so you have to work hard, and you can build your muscle up to work at 100%, and you will do better than the average bear, as we say. So everybody should have an exercise program. Okay, so here we are, don't panic. What is an exercise program? What is that? Okay, exercise program, who has that? You need, every day you do weight bearing, excuse me, you do strength, exercises, you do something aerobic, and then you do some flexibility in limited quantities. So how many people here have exercise programs that they do? And they really do, great. So you guys are way ahead of it. So now the question is, does your exercise, is your exercise program helping you? And that's what you have to figure out. And so how do you figure that out? So here are some principles. Number one, you should be doing closed chain exercises. Closed chain exercises mean that there are no joints flying in the air. That if you're, when you're doing upper body work, your feet are on the ground, everything is supported, that's number one. Number two, the goal of exercise is you want to create some flexion in your joints. You want your joints not to fully extend. And when I get a kid, I can really develop this as they grow because I can really get them not to fully extend their elbows, not to fully extend those knees. You should never stand with your knees extended. You should always be standing with your knees slightly flexed. That means slightly bent. That is really, really important. Never use full extension. So when you're doing exercises, if your physical therapist or you are letting you come out straight, that's wrong. You should only come out to have your bent. Everything should be done so that you are coming in and out in that control plane, slowly out and slowly back. Most people are like this, do, 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 do. That is not exercising. That is creating a wind, okay? Exercise means you bring your arms in slowly. The muscles are now working, the concentric muscles are working. And then I bring out slowly with control, eccentric. So I'm strengthening and controlling. No problem with my joints. So every joint you do has that. The elbows are the easiest to demonstrate because you really don't want to see me flinging legs around. So, but every joint has that and that's what the therapist has to do with you. The other thing that you couldn't see is, my next point here, is it's all about the core. So, okay, everybody stand up. I have five minutes. Everybody stand up. Not leaving, but just stand up. Those who can, those who don't want to, it's okay. All right, 
so now, what's the most important core muscles we have? The area from our belly button down to the top of our pubis. Those are our deep abdominals. How do we feel those? We feel them, if you don't know what they feel like, just to suck them in, blow out candles. Everybody blow out candles. Feel how tight they got? Feel that? You should feel it. You should feel yourself getting tight in your lower abs if you really blow out candles and really pull in. So now hold those in, hold your core in. Now tighten your hiney muscles, squeeze your butt together, bend your knees slightly, bring your shoulders back, those rhomboids we tried before. That's how you should be standing when you stand on line, okay? You shouldn't be standing with your legs back kneed that you can back knee. You need a soft knee. Now we're in an exaggerated position. If you just make your knees soft, then bring in your butt, you'll probably feel better. But that's the way you should stand. It's hard to get that. We talked about it a little bit with proprioception. So use a mirror. You guys, if you want, can sit or we can exercise more. So you can use a mirror to gain perspective. And that's important, that's what the ballerinas do, it's what I do, I always do that with my patients. I say stand in front of the mirror, because you have to feel it. And sometimes you don't get that proprioception. You're like, this is absolutely wrong. My patients say, this is wrong, I look ridiculous, I feel ridiculous. I'm like, no, this is the way you're supposed to be standing. So it's gonna take you six months if you're an adult to unlearn the bad posture, the bad balance. The other last thing is only use low weights, high repetition. You should never use more than three to five pounds, three or five pounds, three or five, not 35, three or five pounds around your shoulders in anybody. Heavier weights put more stress across our joints and we would wear them out. The shoulder surgeons love it because they have a lot of surgery to do on people's shoulders, rotator cuff problems, etc. You should not do things overhead like this, a lot of overhead heavy bench pressing like this. You want to keep it very light and just doing the motion. Again, it's about control, not about how much you lift. It's about control and having that concentric, eccentric, concentric, eccentric, very important. Most women, we're all weak in our upper body, so if you have EDS and you're a woman, you've got the double whammy, so you really have to work on your upper body. So at that, I'm gonna stop, because I know we probably have two minutes, and then I will be here for questions. And I thank you, this is our hospital in New York, and that's the FDR drive underneath. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Raggio. There's going to be questions in the foyer uh, with Dr. Raggio because I know there's probably a lot of you that have things to ask. So if you could make your way to the back there and um, Dr. Raggio will join you shortly. Thank you very much. Oh, 20-somethings. If there's any in the room or parents of them, they'll be meeting in by that water cooler at lunch for you to all have lunch together. So um, spread the word. <laughs>